All right, our next speaker is Lisa Markovchik, Center for Adaptable Western Landscapes, and she comes from Northern Arizona University. Thanks, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the soil microbiome and how it might intersect with the things that you're interested in. And I've been kind of stuck in this confluence for a little while, so I'm excited to be here to learn from all of you and hear your feedback. And uh, I'm going to focus in particular on mycorrhizal fungi today because there's a suite of water services that they are known to provide that I think might be of interest. So I'm going to start, if I can get my advancer to work, maybe, oh. just uh, to make sure we're all on the, sun, the same page. So mycorrhizae just literally means fungus root. It's an ancient symbiosis between fungi and plant roots that nearly all land plants depend on. And you can kind of see in the picture here, the yellow brown roots of the little seedling and then a whole bunch of white fungal hyphae coming off of that. So most of that underground picture there is actually the fungal hyphae. And uh, this is just a visual summary from one of our, my recent papers uh, that talks about all the different ecosystem services provided by these guys. I used to be a land manager at the Navy for a really long time. So I find it really helpful to think about it in terms of ecosystem services. So whole bunch of stuff going on on the left if we have a healthy mycorrhizal community and then a whole bunch of services lost going on on the right there if we have lost our mycorrhizal community. Um, and I'm not going to talk about them all today, but I did want to talk about the ones that I think might be of most interest to you. So there's several different ways that mycorrhizae intersect with this local water cycle and evaporative cooling cycle. And I'm just gonna try to cover them all a little bit. And I'm gonna focus less on what I've done to date and more on where I think we could be going. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So first of all, um, I'm gonna talk about soil aggregation. So on the left, we have a microscopic image of a conglomerate of soil particles with a whole bunch of hyphae sticking out of it. And then the authors have broken down this diagram for us. And the two that I most wanna draw your attention to of what's going on in this diagram is the hyphal enmeshment on the bottom. And you can see they have a little uh, soil water potential symbol down there, and then on the right, the glue-like secretion. So essentially hyphae are enmeshing soil particles and also emitting these glue-like secretions that hold them together in addition to a few other things that are going on here, like attracting other microbes that can also form, for instance, uh, bacterial films. And as a result, mycorrhizae increase aggregate sizes. And as I go through and show you some of these examples, um, there's a couple of things that I want you to notice. So in this, in this graph, for instance, we have the control and then two different mycorrhizal species to the right of that. And they're mostly testing it in the lab or the greenhouse. Um, but you can see that the effect sizes are actually you know, fairly meaningful in that they're doubling and tripling those aggregate sizes. Mycorrhizae also improve aggregate stability. So you can see, for instance, the planted version versus the mycorrhizal version. And you can also actually see that the mycorrhizal version is the closest to the engineering solution um, on the far right. And they're also increasing soil porosity and pore sizes. Again, testing two different um, mycorrhizal species in comparison to the non-mycorrhizal control in like a greenhouse situation. And as a result, they're increasing plant available water. And the, one of the most interesting things um, that I love about this research that pops up again and again in the literature is that the benefits that we see often tend to increase under stress. Um, so when we're thinking about a change in climate and drought stress and extremes, I think this is particularly an interesting point. The other thing that pops up again and again in the literature, and you'll see it in these examples, is that the biodiversity 
and the pairings between the plants and the fungi matter. So for instance, here, to illustrate those two points, you can see, oops, wrong, wrong one. You can see on the left, the well-watered version, um, that high full water absorption rates are better than the non-mycorrhizal, but in the drought stress version, we get an even bigger effect. Also, you can see these two different mycorrhizal species and they're performing differently because just like in our communities, different individuals or different species um, will go ahead and perform different tasks differently or better or worse. And this is just another example that's coming out of our lab at NAU. Um, these are actually on pinion pines and they're the same uh, locations same species, just two different genetic strains. And we can see that Giapora is a, a, a genus of mycorrhizae, and in the tree that it normally pairs with on the left here, under drought conditions, they use actually a particle accelerator to get this information. Water flow and water uptake were increased under drought conditions to the plant. However, if you pair them with the tree species they don't normally pair with and you kind of force it on them, it actually decreases the water flow and uptake. So that diversity and pairing really, really matters. The other thing that mycorrhizae are known to do is increase soil water repellency. And again, we can see here the control situation on the bottom and then a whole bunch of different species of mycorrhizae. And you can see they perform all differently, right? So again, that biodiversity matters. Um, and you guys can probably tell me even better than I know, um, but I understand soil water repellency can often be a problem with water infiltration. So I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge that it can also be a drought adaptation in certain circumstances and that with mycorrhizae, we're talking about soil water repellency in the ground. We're not talking about the situation where the soil surface has been disturbed and is therefore not allowing water to infiltrate. We're actually talking more about in the soil, once water gets there, the soil water repellency can act as a drought adaptation to reduce evaporation and trap that soil moisture for the plant's benefit. They are also known to move water vertically as part of that nightly hydraulic lift cycle that plants do, where they move water from the lower soil depths to the upper soil depths. I love these pictures because they use fluorescent dyes so you can actually see the water traveling through the hyphae. And again, we see that biodiversity really matters because only a small percentage of the mycorrhizal community does this. They also seem to share water between plants. So my common mycorrhizal networks, which are just two plants linked by a hyphal connection are really, really hard to prove. However, the best available science we have seems to indicate they're also transporting water horizontally under drought conditions to potentially provide water to plants that need it. And you can see on the bottom here, a hyphal tip actually leaking water. So they, they are actually leaking water into those upper soil layers as well, providing water that's available to plants. They're also mediating stomatal conductance, which is just the stomatal opening of beyond that of where the plant would be otherwise. So here's your non-mycorrhizal situation. And then this is everything from these two um, mycorrhizal species. They're, as a result, increasing plant water use efficiency, right? Soil moisture and plant fuel moisture and things like that. But the studies from the greenhouse and the labs indicate that we could actually be doing a lot on the land um, for the benefit of it. And so uh, I'm actually starting a project in Santa Fe National Forest, and I'm looking for additional collaborators to take a look at how some of these things are playing out in the field and scaling up. And so I would love to talk to you um, if you are interested in learning more or collaborating. <laughs> Maybe I'll get my slide back now. Um, and it could be Santa Fe National Forest or it could be somewhere else but we wanna be looking at things like soil moisture and how to tie into the soil moisture monitoring network, um, as well as how that, what that variation looks like over a finer scale and how to make those kind of recommendations. So that was a really long answer to your question, Stephanie, thank you. 
It's coming. The master. Yay. <laughs> so yeah, so I was just gonna say many disturbances impact these native communities. And you know, even if you think that area hasn't had a disturbance, pollution deposition is actually a really big one, um, as well as a variety of other things, including like even when we have invasive species, the pesticides that we might try to use to get rid of them, um, they take a really long time to come back. So you can see here, these are all adjacent to each other. And you can see that the undisturbed area that was still intact had far higher um, EMF or ectomycorrhizal colonization than a place even 30 years after disturbance, much less two years after. Um, and as a result, we get sort of these self-reinforcing conditions, but no one's really explored that in the field with some of these water services. And I think that's really good news because so far the, in, the info from the lit tells us that we can have really important benefits and effects grow with time. So we're starting a project in Santa Fe National Forest, looking for collaborators, also looking for funding um, to take a look at how we can scale this up and look at the mycorrhizal community in conjunction with the site histories and the things that we're interested in like fuel moisture and soil moisture and how they all interact and relate. And I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Adaptable Western Landscapes. I'm also an ecologist. Um, I've been working with Wild Earth Guardians, which is a nonprofit. They wanted to start a mycorrhizae program. So there's a couple of different ways to get a hold of me. You can actually go to uh, the mycorrhizae webpage they set up and find out more. And you can scroll down and click on get updates and you can sign up for either all the updates or just the mycorrhizae ones. And then a few couple different emails for me. Um, and then I just wanted to say thanks to so many people who've made my research, my time here, et cetera, possible. So huge thank you, as well as to you for all your time and attention. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to take one question. Okay. We have one question. All right. Um, very interesting presentation. Uh, I think it's really good to for us all to think about how mycorrhizae affects soil moisture. And you give a lot of good examples about how that might happen. Do you have any recommendations on how we can leverage those relationships between mycorrhizae, you know, and like specific communities, um, pairing mycorrhizae to different plants, et cetera, um, for improving soil moisture um, monitoring and, and utilization? Yeah, I think uh, we've talked a lot about, first of all, collecting other data when you collect soil moisture data, right? The, the physical structures of the soil, the chemistry, but we haven't really talked about or, or possibly even thought about what biology measures we might wanna collect. I would, I would make the argument that looking at the mycorrhizal communities is a good one, knowing your site history and being able to look at those two in conjunction along with the soil moisture might tell you a lot about not only how to interpret that, but also if there's something proactive you could do, which is I think um, something we haven't really talked as much about is the proactive management actions we can take. Um, Claudia made a great start, right? And I think we could go there with mycorrhizae as well, because it's absolutely possible to restore them 